Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for everything you have done for us. And welcome to Ephesians Vision Ministry, a service we call The Way, 9 a.m., and then we have one other service at 1030 this morning. There's so much that God's put on my heart that it might end up being two different subject matters, two different services, but uh, uh, it's kind of amazing. It, uh, different pastors have different methods, but how God works with me is, is I'll prepare a sermon, and then I'll come here and, and start uh, uh, fine-tuning it, and God will say, well, we're going to talk about something different this morning. And that's okay. Uh, different strokes for different folks. But uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, we want to talk this morning about expanding the kingdom of God. What does that look like today? And why are we still here? I mean, we were supposed to be raptured, right? Uh, it was in all, all of the newspapers, all the TV shows, and people are laughing about it right now. We're probably the butt of jokes. Uh, we didn't give the prophecy because it was incorrect, obviously. But it's the uh, butt of jokes for everybody that wants to laugh at Christians. So, you know, people might be laughing at us today. That's okay. Uh, God still loves them. God still loves them. Well, the rapture was supposed to occur on the 21st of June. That was yesterday. So what does the Bible have to say about the signs of the end of the age? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll start in verse 1. Uh, signs of the end of the age. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these buildings, he asked, Jesus said. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will all of this happen? And what will the sign be of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? The disciples wanted to know, and, and, and everybody kind of wants to know, when's the end coming? When's the end coming? And when somebody comes up with a new prophecy or with a new revelation, they've studied the Bible and they say, oh, I figured it out. The world will end uh, yesterday. Well, it didn't, did it? Uh, so Jesus answered. Jesus answered in the Word of God. And one of the things that I want to want to tell people, tell ministries, tell pastors, tell anyone, that thinks you've got it figured out. Jesus didn't even know. Only the Father knows. So use the Word of God in context. There is a verse in here that says no one knows the date. Okay? No one knows the date. Uh, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're hearing about that today. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Jesus said so many times in the Word of God, do not fear. Here he says, don't be alarmed. You're going to hear rumors, wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. We're seeing that now. We've seen that for decades and thousands of years. Kingdom against kingdom. We're going to be talking about a kingdom today. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are just the beginnings of the birth pangs. Now let's jump over to uh, Matthew 24, verse 36. The day and the hour unknown. This is specifically what we want to stress. No one knows about that date or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So only the Father knows, only Dad, only Abba Father, only God the Father knows when the end of the age, end of this age will come, when the rapture will occur. Until then, Jesus says, go about the business of the kingdom. The business of the kingdom is telling people about Jesus Christ. The business of the kingdom, what I, what, what I liken a church to, what a church should be, is an embassy of the kingdom of God. Now, when you think about an embassy on foreign soil, like a United States embassy in Argentina, for example, on the ground that the U.S. embassy sits in Argentina, that is soil that is actually the United States. All the laws, all the protocols, that is under the domain, under the control 
of the United States of America, even though it's in Argentina. That land has been deeded, deeded to the United States because that is the embassy of the United States. That's kind of an outpost. And all of our laws apply there. Likewise, when a foreign country has a uh, embassy here in the United States, in Washington, D.C., or New York, on that ground, the laws of that nation apply in the embassy. Okay? So, the church should be an embassy of the kingdom of God. We're going to be talking uh, in days to come about the kingdom of God. And... Um, there have been pastors, preachers that have been talking about the kingdom of God for a long time. I love, the more I dig into it, the more I'm just excited about it. We are here to bring the kingdom. We are here to be a light shining in darkness. And we are here to act as citizens or ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We are here to say, there is a different way. You don't have to be afraid. There is a kingdom. In reality, there is a kingdom that exists today in heaven. Jesus is still alive. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The kingdom of God, Jesus said to the disciples, is here within you. So, the church should be ambassadors of this kingdom. So, in the kingdom, all the rules apply. All the laws apply. All the protocols apply. So, the people that are the church, the church is not a building. The church is not a denomination. The church is not a ministry. The church are people like Peter who confess that Jesus is the Christ. And, and uh, Jesus said, on this declaration of faith, I will build my church on people. People are my church. So the kingdom of God, the rules of the kingdom are that Jesus Christ is king. The rules of the kingdom are that healing still applies today. Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So, are we going to affect change in the culture, or are we going to be changed by the culture? Which kingdom will rule in your life? Will it be the kingdom of the world, which says uh, when you get sick? Now, uh, hear me out on this. When you get sick, the first thing you do is go get medicine and go to the doctor. Now, I'm not saying that's bad, and I'm going to be talking about that this morning. I am not saying don't go to the doctor, so please don't un uh, misunderstand me. There are times you have to go to the doctor. I had, two years ago, I had three surgeries in one year on my kidneys. So, I am not saying don't go to the doctor. But the first thing you do when you get sick, I believe, is seek God. Pray for healing. So one of the rules of the kingdom is go first to the king to, to ask for whatever you, you have not because you have not asked. Ask for healing. Uh, case in point, uh, one of my surgeries, there was a, a problem, and I actually uh, vomited. I threw up during the surgery. And uh, the stomach acid went into my lungs, and it destroyed some of the avelia, which are the little grape-like clusters that... Uh, oxygenate your blood and the surgeon said we don't know what we're going to do with you because we you can't renew those once those have been destroyed so we are kind of concerned about your prognosis and what you're going to end up with but I had no fear during that so I went home uh, with, with uh, pneumonia two days later in fact let's see I went home I believe it was two days later but on a Saturday in my bedroom at home I prayed and worshiped to God for two hours. And in that two hours, my lung capacity doubled from 150 milliliters to 300 milliliters because I had a device there that could measure that. Um, and God healed me. And it felt like rubber bands were breaking off my chest when I would breathe in. And I would just praise and worship. In two hours, my lung capacity doubled. So you could say, well, you didn't have, you shouldn't have gone to the doctor in the first place. Just had the surgery. You should have just trust, trusted God. So if that was the case, I would have been in sin. So why would God have healed me from that, from the damage to the lungs? So, in my experience, and I believe the Word of God is clear on this, we are not saying do not go to the doctor, but what we are saying is ask first from the King. Go to God and ask for healing. 
and a couple of healings that we want to share with you happened here in this building. Uh, the other night, a man came in uh, who had a leg, one leg shorter than the other for 20 years. We prayed, the members of our healing room team prayed for him, and that night in the room, his leg grew two inches. And it was really fun to see because everybody jumped back. It just kind of happened, and it was amazing. And, and just thank you, Lord, for that. The man, I t- we talked to the man uh, just the other day, days after this happened, legs still longer than it was. For 20 years, it was short because of an accident he had. And uh, praise God for that. Just, just praise God. Another healing that happened was a man uh, who had injured his shoulder very severely. And he, it hurt so bad he couldn't sleep. And he went for days without sleeping. The last time he injured it in such a way, uh, it took months to heal. And so they called for prayer and they said, you know, we, he said, I, I need my sleep. I really need my sleep. So we prayed. Two days later, in fact, I got a call last night from the man. Uh, and he was saying, I just want to praise God. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, it's totally, completely healed. He said, I can wash my hair. And before I couldn't even sleep, but now I can wash my hair. I have full motion of my arm. And praise God. It, it, he just kept saying it over and over again. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. So in the kingdom... The rules of the kingdom apply. In the kingdom, when you go into the presence of God, when you're under the lordship of Jesus Christ, kingdom rules apply. One of the rules is that Jesus says, I am willing to heal. Every time in the word of God, when people came up to Jesus to ask for healing, he said, I am willing. He never said, well, you need to suffer a little longer. Or uh, Jesus never said, well, you've got a thorn in your flesh. And there are people that believe that since Paul had a thorn in his flesh, that God is sending disease to correct us, to grow us in our character, grow us in our faith. I don't believe that God sends any diseases or calamities. One of the things that angers me is when insurance policies write act of God in their policy. It is not an act of God. It's, it's a casualty of sin in this world. I believe God can use what the enemy designed for evil to use it for good, but the evil does not come from God. There is nothing evil in him. Pontius Pilate said that about Jesus. I can find nothing wrong in him. This this man has no sin, Uh, but we crucified him anyway. That's another story, another sermon. So the kingdom, the church needs to be an embassy of the kingdom of God. So when people come into a church, they should find fruits of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, faithfulness, long-suffering. They shouldn't just find a social club. They shouldn't just find a motivational sermon to, to try to get them through the next week. They should find that the rules of the kingdom apply. And the rules of the kingdom are that Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ loves you. And they should feel loved into the family of God. Um, Jesus said, if you have not love, you have nothing. You can talk with tongues of angels, perform all kinds of miracles, do all kinds of stuff. If you don't have love, you have nothing. First comes love. You, You demonstrate the love of God. You show the love of God in a situation where it's not warranted or deserved more importantly let's say someone's wrong to you you show the love of God and sometimes you have to pray for that God man this person really hurt me and and I can't love him in my strength but please God and somebody needs to hear this please God just allow me to love them in my in your strength allow your love to flow through me and let me love them like Jesus did you pray that prayer and God will I believe equip you and enable you to do that. So as people come into the embassy, they're under the covering of the kingdom, under the kingdom of God. Uh, So churches all over the world should be little embassies 
where kingdom rules apply. And it's not a social club. It's not a clique. It's not um, a motivational sermon. I went to a church one time. I'm not going to tell you which country it was or where it was. But they did not mention the word Jesus or any scriptures during the entire sermon. It was like going to a motivational sermon. So I went up to the pastor afterwards and I said, how come you didn't say Jesus or, or um, quoting the scriptures? He said, I, I wanted to hear scriptures. And his answer really was interesting to me. It's, well, we want everyone to feel welcome and we don't want to offend anyone and we want to bring them into the kingdom, but we, we're afraid they'll be, we're afraid, do not fear. We're afraid they'll be offended. And so we purposely kind of keep that very low key. Jesus said, blessed are those who are not offended in me. Jesus came and he had a lot of things to say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He cleared the temple. He flipped over the tables of the money changers. And he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. And you've turned it into a den of thieves. So sometimes the word of God is correction. Sometimes people might be offended by it. That's okay. The father disciplines the children he loves. If you have children and you never discipline them, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with out of control kids, aren't you? A father and a mother, but a father disciplines those he loves. So it is with the word of God. Jesus said, I want to say that again, blessed is he who is not offended in me. There are so many, uh, if I offend somebody, I ask your forgiveness. But there are churches, Christian churches, that will not, such as this church did, talk from the scripture, quote scripture, or use the name of Jesus Christ because they don't want to offend anyone. We are coming to a time and date in this uh, world where the battle lines are going to be drawn and you're going to have to be hot or cold. You're going to have to be, I'm a Christian and I follow Jesus Christ. And you'll have to make a choice. You won't be able to sit on the fence. And some Christians today are fence setters. I wasn't going to say this this morning, but I feel led to. Some Christians are fence setters. And on Sunday morning from 10 to noon, I'm praising God and just everything's wonderful and good. And Monday morning, I'm just kind of, hey, you know, telling dirty jokes in the office and uh, doing all kinds of stuff. And, hey, yeah, let's go to wherever. Jesus is pretty explicit about that. Uh, be either hot or cold. He also talks to one of the churches about, you've forsaken your first love. You loved me, and that love for me has grown cold. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Um, Jesus wants you to go back to your first love. So I believe we're coming in a time and place where you're going to see more and more churches that are hungry to bring in people, that are hungry for tithes, offerings, but that are hungry to bring in people. And the devil is going to say, well, you need to, to attract them. You need to market. That's another thing that I believe is an error in the church today. You want a church growth strategy that works. You preach the kingdom of God. You become an embassy where the kingdom of God rules apply, where healings occur, where the power of God is displayed, and the people will come. Now, initially, when you start to do this, there have been churches that have done this, that have just gone full bore into the kingdom of God, and some people are offended, and they lose membership. Church in particular in Redding, California, Bethel Church went through this, where a lot of people were offended and a thousand left. But they kept true that this is what God is telling us. This is where we need to go. And we are here to please God and not man. And that church is one of the strongest, most uh, charged down the path of, of following God in, uh, churches on the planet. And people from all over the world are going to Redding, California to Bethel Church. But that's an example of a church that said, we're going to follow Jesus Christ. And if people are offended, we'll love them. But we are not going to compromise the message of the gospel. And this other church I was talking about was willing to compromise the message so that people were not offended, so that the people will come. Sometimes people need a word of correction. Um, and don't be afraid to give that. We need to speak the truth in love. 
We need to speak the truth in love, but we need to not be afraid to use the name Jesus Christ. For example, uh, uh, one of the outreaches here is called the Jesus Network. It's a news network for Christians. And God specifically told us to call it TJN, the Jesus Network, because that if you can't say the word Jesus, you can't say who we are. And that's who we should be as Christians. We are Christians, Christ-like. Christians, Christ, Jesus. We are all about Jesus Christ. There's so many things happening in the world today that want us to compromise that message. And legally and otherwise, well, we don't want you to talk about Jesus. We kind of want you to play that down a little bit. And like with the Jesus Network, we can't do that. That's who we are. And as Christians, we should have that same mindset. That is who we are. We are Christ followers. We are Christ... Um, Tommy Tenney has a, did a book and has a uh, ministry. He's the God chaser. And I love the man's heart, and I like, read a lot of Tommy Tenney's books. Um, he's a God chaser, and we need to be God chasers. We need to have a heart like David, and, and we need to chase after God. So, we're still here. <laughs> Amen. So what we need to do is the embassy is still open. Okay, we're still on the planet. The rapture didn't happen. Some ways I wish it would have. Amen. That would have been fun to be on the streets of gold. And, and we're going to go there someday. If you're not a Christian and you want to go there someday, we'll have a chance uh, at the end of the sermon to, um, to pray the sinner's prayer, or in other words, to accept Jesus Christ into your life. So, embassy's still open. We're still on the planet. It's the 22nd, and we're still here. Okay. We need to do the work of the kingdom. The work of the kingdom is spreading the good news that someone died for your sin so you don't have to. The good news is that Jesus Christ loves you so much. He went to the cross, died, was in the tomb for third, three days, rose, sat at the right hand of the Father, and because he did that, when you die, you will instantly be in the presence of God. A relationship with Jesus Christ is more than just fire insurance. Some people treat Christianity, and some people are what we call CE Christians, Christian and Easter. They go to church on, Christi or on, on Christmas and Easter, and the rest of the time they just kind of pay their uh, um, fire insurance policy. Well, I've got, I've, got, I've got a card here that says I'm a Christian. I have a certificate here that says I was baptized this one day and got my fire insurance policy paid. I'm going to heaven, but in the meantime, I'm going to have some fun over here. Okay? Uh, that's not what Jesus said. And you're missing so much. The Christian life is, there are so many people that are afraid that they'll lose so much. They won't be able to party. They won't be able to do whatever, do the lifestyle that they had because they have to follow a book of rules now. But Talk to someone, a friend of yours, who is a Christian, and you know, and you can see the fruit of the Spirit, peace, joy, faithfulness, gentleness, long-suffering. You can see the fruit of the Spirit in their life, and ask them why they're a Christian, and especially if there's um, occasions in their life before they were a Christian where they led, you know, a partying lifestyle. There's such a man uh, by the name of Tom Flaskerud. And we are going to be having an outreach in Bend with Tom. And it is going to be on, I believe, June. Here's the poster. Uh, June 25th at 3 p.m., uh, just south of McMinimums, east of Troy Field in downtown Bend. We have some posters here. And um, we can have them for you. We can give them to you so we can set them up over, uh, display them around town. Tom was an outlaw biker. And he led the lifestyle. He did some stuff that he's not really proud of. The, the woman who is his wife right now, he kidnapped. And the family, her family was afraid to come get her because they were afraid he'd kill him. And so he was an outlaw biker and led, led the lifestyle. Headed an outlaw biker gang. He was convicted watching Billy Graham while 
uh, drinking a beer and eating potato chips and laughing at Billy Graham on the TV. And God, the Holy Spirit convicted him right there, and he knew that he had to make it right. And now uh, he's a wonderful man of God. He takes the, the Freedom Team. The Freedom Team is a, a team that bends uh, bars of steel in their teeth. Um, they um, uh, blow up hot water bottles, uh, rip phone books, fold frying pans, that kind of thing. Um, and they're going to be in downtown Bend June 25th, and he'll be able to share his testimony of what, uh, what it's like to follow Jesus Christ. So he knows what it's like to have that lifestyle, the parting lifestyle, but he knows what it's like to sit at the banquet table in the kingdom. And he will tell you that the joy and the peace that he has in the kingdom do not compare with the world. See, the things of the, of the devil, the things of the world, are fleeting. They might bring you pleasure for the moment, but it doesn't last. Look at drugs. Look at uh, sex out of marriage. If you have sex with so many partners, eventually there's a price to pay. In damaged relationships, there's a soul tie that happens during sex, and um, people are hurt, and sometimes they get illnesses from that. Um, in the drugs, the problem with drugs is they, you, you get addicted to them. They want more and more and more and more and more and more. And eventually it can and usually ends in death. If you've looked at somebody on meth and you look at a picture before and you look at a picture after they've been on meth for several years, you can take a picture of like a, a very handsome young man or a very, very beautiful woman and she'll look like she's 80 years old. It's in it's incredible, and Bill and Beverly have been in jails and prisons, and they've seen this. And if you've seen posters, the before and the after, man, meth is just such a uh, graphic example of the power of the kingdom of darkness, another kingdom, and, and the lies, because meth is an extremely addictive drug. The, the, um, the rates of addiction, I believe, are like 95% for first-time users. And once you take it, it's such a high that you just want it more and more and more and more. So don't try that. However, I've met people that through the power of God, uh, I've met people I personally know that, that accepted Jesus Christ, and then they took the drug, and the drug did not have the effect on them that it did before. There's something that's been cut because they have entered into a different kingdom. They've entered into, into, into an area where they're covered by a different set of rules. And I probably, there's, there's a woman that I know that when she was young, she tried marijuana. So after she accepted Jesus Christ, she tried it again. And she said, it didn't feel the same. It didn't feel good. It just didn't have that same thing. I couldn't enjoy it because she was in the kingdom. A different set of rules apply. So, when you're in the kingdom of God, a different set of rules apply. What we want to see in church, what we want to see, and the reason why we call this the way, the Sunday morning service, the way, is we're very, very eager to return to the power and the authority of the gospel as there was in the early days of the church when it was called the way. So many times in church today, and from so many people who have tried church, in fact, we did a man on the street interview a while back, and people said, well, I pray, and it just doesn't seem to be good. Any good. And I go to church, and it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me is what we heard a lot. Um, and that's sad. If we look in the early days of the church, if we look uh, when the, the disciples were alive, um, There were days, like in the sec after the uh, second chapter of Acts, I want to go there. Let me jump. Let me take a little bunny trail here. Do, 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 do. When, the, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and the tongues of fire, the Holy Spirit came, Jesus said, Wait here in Jerusalem for the comforter. Wait here. Wait here. Do not, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, on one occasion, while Jesus was eating with them, this is after he'd been 
crucified, rose, and came back again to the disciples, uh, Jesus said, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about before. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he went on to say in uh, verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates, or the Father is set by his own authority. And this again kind of reverts back to the fact that we were raptured yesterday. Jesus is again saying here on a second occasion that only the Father knows when the end of days will come. Let me jump back to uh, verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But, key here, kingdom power key, kingdom key, get this. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There are so many people that are preaching today that the Holy Spirit came in the early days of the church to essentially jumpstart the church, get it started, and now we're in the church age and the Holy Spirit's kind of off there somewhere and he's going to come back. Nowhere in this book does it say the Holy Spirit left the planet. The Holy Spirit fell on the believers in the second chapter of Acts, Pentecost, and he is still here today. And the thing that just really excites me is... uh, the power and the authority that these men walked in after the Holy Spirit came upon them. And as we look at the fruit of that, as we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who accepted the message of of Peter were baptized and 3,000 were added to their number that day. And if we go down to chapter 47 and as we talk of the fellowship of the believers praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved daily the church was growing because the the Holy Spirit was there they saw it in evidence in the power they saw the tongues of fire resting on people there have been reports in fact there was a church overseas I can't remember exactly where it was where they called the fire department because they saw fire inside the building. And they went to the building and they looked in and they saw fire in the building and they called the fire department and they went in and it wasn't fire, it was the Holy Spirit. And these people were praising God. It's amazing to me that we see so many more miracles and so many more evidences of the power and manifestation of God. Not that we're seeking those signs, but those happen when people just run after God. Some people are afraid to seek those signs because they think that you're worshiping those signs. No, it's just an outward manifestation of what happens when you just chase after God. So the Holy Spirit fell, and people were being added by the thousands to the church. People were being healed. The disciples would walk by, uh, and the shadow of Peter would, walk, would fall on a person, and they would be healed. They had words of knowledge. The disciple would, a beggar would come up to a disciple and and expect money with his hand out. And Peter would say, uh, silver or gold I do not have for you, but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ I give you. Uh, I believe that was a a lame person. Pick up your mat, pick up your mat and walk. I do, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have in the name of Jesus Christ I give you. Pick up your mat and walk. Uh, as we look, we have an um, illustration here about the heritage of healing. It's a poster, and it talks about the healing evangelists. And way back here in the early church, from 33 A.D. to 400, healing was a normal part of the everyday life of the believer. And what happened was in the medieval ages, from 400 to 1530, um, 
when darkness came upon the earth, the gifts of healing were not demonstrated as much. But in the early church, for 370 years, 363 years or so, healing was a part of the everyday life of the believer, as it was in the early church. So, oh Lord, we are hungry. We are hungry to see your power manifest in this, in this world. We are hungry to see churches of Jesus Christ as embassies. What I think we need is a redefinition of what church is. We need to be thinking of ourselves as embassies of the kingdom of God. When you're an ambassador, when you're a United States ambassador and you're going to Chile, you are an ambassador for the United States, and you bring the power and the authority of the United States into Chile or into wherever you're at. Let's say Chile. So you walk in and you talk to the government officials in Chile, and you have the full might and power of the United States military backing you up. If an embassy is attacked on foreign soil, the United States military will come in and rescue the citizens because the kingdom moves to enforce the authority of its embassy. This is a word somebody needs to hear. The kingdom of God works in the same way. That as we as Christians work under the power, the anointing of Jesus Christ, and the love of Jesus Christ, the power of the kingdom will back you up. So as you, as you walk out in faith, and there's a lot of people walking in faith right now in the area of finances, healing, so on and so forth. Don't do it foolishly. But ask God for direction. Read his word. Early on in this uh, sermon, we were talking about the fact that there are people out there saying that the rapture was yesterday. Obviously, it wasn't. You need to know as a Christian, you need to know what the word of God says. The word of God, we quoted you two scripture examples here, where Jesus said, only the Father knows. If you know the Bible, even if something I'm saying uh, you say, oh, wait a minute, Dave, that doesn't square. That's, what about this in the scriptures where it says this? And we'll talk about it. But this word is the straight edge. We will not add to. It says in the Bible that this word will not be added to or taken away from. This is the word of God. And, and if, it's, if it's of the Holy Spirit, it's of God, it will agree with this word. So when the word says, no one knows the time or date, the rapture will occur or the end of the day or the end of the season, end of the age today. Believe it. If somebody comes to you and says the world will end tomorrow and I figured it out through a number sequence in the Bible or whatever, remember Jesus said, many false teachers will come to deceive you and many will listen to them. You need to know the word of God. Do not be deceived by false teachers. There's a lot of teaching out there that takes a little bit of the Bible and mixes it with their own kind of theories, and they have a new movement. If you get involved in, in following a charismatic leader, you need to know your Bible so you are not um, led astray, so you are not deceived. You need to know the Word of God. You need to know the Word of God. Another thing... Uh, Pastor Eddie Sienda, he shared this at dinner the other night, and I thought it was so good. It's the parable of the ten virgins. It's Matthew 25, chapter 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who take their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. We are the bride. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. Key. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. You never know what time the, 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 the Son of God will return. Could be in the middle of the night. Could be at midnight. At midnight, the cry rang out. The bridegroom is here. Jesus is here. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, 
Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they went out to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came and said, Sir, sir, please open the door. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And what Eddie Sand and I were talking about was you as Christians need to have your lamp full of oil. Your lamp. You can't go to church every Sunday and just expect the Word of God to be poured into you from the pastor. You need to spend time in the Word yourself, filling up your lamp. Because if something happens in the middle of the night, if your first reaction is to, oh boy, I better call Pastor, Pastor Harry or Joe or whatever his name is. I don't want to use a pastor's name here. And see what he says. You know, oh boy, I better call Pastor Bill. Not Bill Hewitt, but, but he might not like being called at midnight. You need to know. You need to have a connection with God. You need to have your aunt, uh, lamp full of your own oil because as things happen you need to be able to know what God would say Jesus Christ when he died on the cross the curtain in the temple was torn rent asunder from top to bottom and that gave you access to the Holy of Holies before that you had to go through the priest and the priest had to go in there and pay your sacrifice you couldn't go to God but now the curtain's been torn and you can go to God. Why did that happen? If, if God still wanted you to go through the pastor or whatever, then why did he tear the, why did he wear the, why, blah, blah, blah. why did he tear the curtain? He tore the curtain so you could have access, you could have access to the Holy of Holies. You need to have your lamp full of oil. You need to know what the Word of God says. So somebody at the street comes up to you and says, Hey, the world's going to end tomorrow. I figured it all out in the Bible. I hope your answer is, Well, let me call Pastor Bill. Bill, is that right? Somebody told me that, that the world was going to end. Nope. See, Bill is only one person. And if everybody in Bend is calling Bill because they want to know what Bill says, he's not going to be able to answer them. If God can number the hairs on everyone's head... He knows what's going on in your life. If he tore the curtain in the temple asunder so you could have access, he wants you to have access. So if your first reaction is to, I better call the pastor. No. Your first access is, okay, what does the Word of God say? And what does, what is God telling me? What do I hear in the Holy Spirit? Now the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit, and let's talk about this a little bit. There are some that say, well, if you just have everybody doing their own thing, it'll be chaos, and we have to have control in the church. I believe that is a pharisaical and sadducical spirit, because what I've experienced is when you get believers together and they pray, and we do this a lot in this ministry, is um, here's what I'm hearing. You go and pray and see what you're, what you're uh, hearing. And so many times will come together and will say the exact same thing. Because as we believe that the Holy Spirit and God, but specifically the Holy Spirit, is a big enough God that He can control the church Himself, thank you very much. It is Jesus' bride. It is not the pastor in control. It is the Holy Spirit in control, and someone needs to hear that. Okay, I'm not being critical of pastors. I'm a pastor. And I'm not saying don't listen to your pastor. But what I am saying is you need to have your lamp oil filled with your own oil. You need to spend time in the Word of God. Your relationship with God is not a surrogate relationship. You can't say, well, you know, I'm really busy having a good time and I want Bill to do all my Christian stuff. A lot of men do this with their wives. Well, she goes to church. She does the church thing. I'm going to go out here. I'm going to stay home and watch the game. 
ducks are playing today or the beavers are playing today. Let's see how many people I can offend right now. Um, God is saying, I want you to have a relationship with, you, with, with me. I want you to know me, and I want to know you. And I'm not saying it's bad to watch the Ducks or the Beavers or the Boise State Broncos. I love the Broncos. Love the Broncos. Uh, and I love football and basketball and, and uh, all like that. But you don't put that above. If you're, if you're saying, oh, man, I hope church gets over because i got to go watch the game. What is the idol in your life? What are you giving? What are you worshiping? Okay? Something to think about. Fill up your own oil. Fill up your own lamp with your own oil. Don't be a foolish virgin. Know what the Bible says. So when somebody comes up on you in the street and says something that sounds okay, but you know there's something inside of you that says, I don't think that's right. You need to know what the Word of God says. And Bill's phone's busy because everybody else is calling him. So don't be calling Bill. So I'm sorry to pick on you this morning, Bill. Uh, I, hope you ha I hope what we said this morning encouraged you. There's just so much going on. Um, we do want to, um, a couple things we want to tell you about. Of course, the Freedom Team Power Explosion, uh, June 25th, downtown Bend, 3 p.m. It's a Saturday, uh, 16 Northwest Kansas Avenue. It's going to be in the parking lot of the Environmental Center. The Power Team uh, performs feats of strength and shares their testimony in Jesus Christ. Uh, we have free Bibles here at Ephesians Vision Ministries, uh, 711 Northeast Butler Market Road, Bend, Oregon, and you can stop by and pick one up. We have 24-hour prayer and worship going on here. Uh, we believe Jesus said, uh, my house will be called a house of prayer. This is an embassy of God, one of many around the world. Another thing I want to say is, is, and I'm trying to offend as many people as I can this morning, but if there is a church, speaking of this prophecy that was in error that said uh, the rapture will occur yesterday, if your church says, don't listen to them, but we're the only ones with the answer, run. Because the, the body of Christ is a body. There are different churches making up the body of Christ. There is not one church with the answer. We are collectively to work together. There is error in the body of Christ, and your pastor will give you good teaching. But if one of the things they say is, we are the only church with the answer, run. Because that they're not hearing from God. I want to share that with you this morning. Uh, so we are one of many embassies in the kingdom of God. We are here to love people. We are here to serve God, and we are here to uh, do the stuff. Pray for healing. Believe that God heals. Yes, it's okay to go to the doctor, but the first thing we want to do is pray. I've been physical. Uh, I've experienced healing myself. Others have experienced healing. Sometimes you have to get surgery, but sometimes God heals. And Jesus said, I am willing. So the first thing you do is pray. There's a cross right here, and I want to I want to close with this. Uh, Luke, chapter nine, verse twenty-three, and then I'll go away for half an hour or so. Uh, where to go? Where to go? Jesus was saying, "If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself." and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So, Jesus said, pick up his cross. What we're going to be doing as a ministry is we're going to be doing a crosswalk. And you're going to see us from time to time out throughout Central Oregon and the state carrying this cross. And we're not going to beat people up with the Bible. We're just going to start a dialogue with them about what the cross of Jesus Christ means and what a relationship with Jesus Christ means. So we are going to pick up the cross.
and walk it. And our first crosswalk is going to be next Saturday somewhere here in Bend. If you want to join us, we have two crosses, so if you want to carry a cross with us, that'd be great. Uh, Pastor Eddie Cienda and some other folks are going to be joining us. So if you want to join us, uh, contact us here at Ephesians Vision Ministries. Uh, our phone number is 541-323-2882, 541-323-2882, or an email address is, is um, dave at evm1.info. That's dave at evm, the number one, dot info. So be blessed, and possibly we'll see you in about 30 minutes. Have a great day. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.